Well, good morning, Tri-State. Uh, quick question, how many, by a show of hands, how many of you were here last week to hear Eric uh, introduce our new sermon series? Okay, those of you who were here last week, how many of you brought back your Matthew manual? Hold those up if you brought your Matthew manual back with you. That's great. Glad to see a lot of people brought their Matthew manual back with them this week. If you have that, open up with me to page 20, and we'll actually be looking this week at um, a section that, that I'm titling The Gospel-Centered Life. It, basically what it means to actually be a Christian. If you are here this morning and you don't have your Matthew manual with you or you didn't get one, uh, in your newsletter there is a small uh, insert folded in half and you can take that out uh, and you can fill that in as we proceed and we go along. Now, now if you missed last week and, or if you have not seen Eric's presentation um, you can actually go online to our YouTube page and actually watch Eric introduce this whole sermon series. Now, the whole My Hope project is this, this brainchild of Billy Graham, who, who uh, coming up in November of this year, will be doing a televised special that, that features interviews, um, different testimonies, and, and a variety of different tools all in this televised program so that you, uh, as believers, can invite your unchurched, unsafe friends into your home that they can taste and see the Lord truly is good and, and hopefully have a dramatic impact on this nation spiritually. Now that's in November. The, the, the reason that we're doing it so early here at Tri-State is so that we don't get to November and then turn our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers into evangelistic targets, okay, and like lasso them into our home with the promise of cookies, okay, and then and then do the bait and switch where you put the little the TV thing on, and now it's like all of a sudden, like wow, this is like right here in your face. No, no, no. We we are trying to promote this project in such a way that when November has come, when November has rolled around, that you already have had people in your life that you have been interacting with regularly, that that now understand what it is that you're trying to share with them, and that that November event then becomes the, the culmination uh, of all of our efforts corporately as well as uh, each of us individually as we look to our friends' neighbors to figure out what it is that, that we can do to share Christ with them. And so this morning we're looking at this whole subject of the gospel-centered life. And basically we're looking at the question of what's it actually mean to be a Christian. Here's the reality that we have to look at with this whole project most people that we are going to interact with will not be completely unchurched. Like, like chances are they are like de-churched. Um, they attended church growing up, um, had a bad experience with a flannel graph in Sunday school, and, and they haven't gone back since. Or, or, I, I'm being facetious, but there are people out there who have had such negative experiences of church and of Christians that the whole idea of participating in any kind of Christian activity is it, just, it's just, it, it's not what, the average person in our world wants to participate in. Been there, done that. And if you actually look at the studies that have been done recently on what non-believers think about Christians, uh, among the very negative adjectives used to describe Christians is that we are too focused on getting converts. And, and the, really, the really ironic thing about our nation right now is that never before have people been more willing to talk about spirituality or spiritual things. And at the same time, in this exact same nation, people have never been more unwilling to listen to Christians. One third of people outside the walls of, of, of church say that Christians don't really care about what they're actually, uh, actually care about non-believers they're actually trying to reach. They don't actually care about them. They're trying to promote a prod, prod, product without actually caring about the person they're trying to sell it to. And so the whole idea of this whole gospel-centered life is to just really evaluate who we are as believers and how that identity then is received by the people around us. It, my, my whole point this morning is very simple, that, that minor misunderstandings of the gospel will always lead to major problems in the way that we interact with others. Our theme verse for this morning is 1 Peter 3.15, In your hearts set apart Christ as Lord, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Elsewhere in the same letter it says, 
that even angels long to look into these things, that the gospel is not just your ticket into heaven. It's not just your get of hell free card. It's not just your fire insurance. It impacts everything that you say or do as a person who functions in this world. Even the angels long to look into these things. Angels never get bored with the gospel. And neither should we. What is the gospel? There are two aspects of the gospel in the way I'm presenting it this morning. The first is the basic idea of salvation, that we are, our sins have been dealt with through the cross, and that also we are being regenerated, regeneration through the work of Christ's Spirit. And so my outline actually comes to us this morning from Psalm chapter 1. It says this, Psalm 1 is all about wisdom and how to actually be a wise person in the midst of a, a, a interesting and very difficult culture. In Psalm 1, David says this, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the, in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. wither. Whatever he does prospers. The, the psalm is talking about what it means to actually live a blessed life. Now, now it's not saying happiness. Like, like you get that, right? Like, like he's talking about what it means to have a life that is full of vibrance, joy, prosperity in the spiritual sense. He's not necessarily saying that, that the Christian life will instantly make you happy. God gives us no promises that we will have a victorious life in the, in the worldly secular sense of, of health, wealth, money, riches, fame. But he does give us some huge promises that we will experience joy when we take and we understand the gospel for its full dimension of what it actually is. And so this morning our whole outline comes down to, to this. Uh, the gospel-centered life is in terms of what it's not, and then we'll talk about what it actually is. Um, so the, what it's not, we're going to look at the whole page here of legalism or love. And the first blank talks about there are two basic needs that we have as human beings. Two basic needs. The first is significance, and the second is security. That we want to be people who are noticed. We want to be people who are valued. We want to be people who are secure in our identity of who we are. And, and what, what happens so very often is that we, we look to various and, and different things to try and find that happiness and that security and that significance. And, and what often happens is that people look to things other than God to satisfy those two basic needs. That Martin Luther, the 16th century writer and the reformer, he said that, that when we ignore the first commandment to honor God ahead of everything else, if we ignore that, something always takes God's place. And for many people, it becomes religion that takes God's place. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 2. I think we'll see this actually played out in the lives of some of the early believers. Galatians chapter 2. We'll start in verse 11. When Cephas, that's Peter, when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas and part of all, all of them, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Christ Jesus. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. What's happening? Peter was a good guy who got a little led astray by the idolatry of making sure he looked good in the eyes of others. Apparently what was happening is that there were these, these guys, these false teachers in the church of Galatia at the time that said to, to be a good follower of Jesus, 
You had to obey all of the older ceremonial laws, circumcision on down. And you actually had to, to follow the law so rigorously that, that Peter was pulling away from the Gentile believers to associate himself only with those who looked, thought, and acted like he did. And the result was there was a huge rift in the community that Paul is now seeking to address by pointing them back to the gospel and saying it's not by works of the law that you experience salvation. So why is it that you're going back to works of the law to fully experience God's regeneration and God's redemptive work in your life? Why? And and, in the end, what we are left with is an example here of, of these roadblocks to relationship. Your next blank going down, there there are four D's, these roadblocks to relationship. When, When we attach meaning and significance to religious ritual apart from the gospel, we end up with attitudes that are demanding, demeaning, domineering, and dogmatic. No one wants to be with somebody like that. No one wants to become someone like that. No one wants to actually experience a relationship with somebody like that, so those become barriers to relationship and they become barriers to the spread of the gospel. The famous writer G.K. Chesterton said that there are many different ways uh, to to fall, but only one way to stand upright. Basically, it's almost as if Christianity is on the edge of a knife where you can fall into one category or another. And, And so our two categories this morning... I'm talking about our, our legalism uh, and, and hedonism. Let's talk about legalism first. Turn to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians was a big thank you letter. Paul was in house arrest at the time. And he writes to his fellow believers in the church at Philippi. He says this, chapter 3, verse 2. Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. For it's we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. Just like in Galatia, there are some folks out there, even in the church in Philippi, who said to be a good follower of Jesus, you have to fulfill the law, circumcision being a really bold, very public uh, demonstration thereof, and a real big sign of commitment then in that era. And what Paul is saying is that, listen, don't worry so much about the outward expressions as long as you are inwardly devoted to what Christ has been doing in your life. So what happens with legalism is that legalism becomes focused with fulfilling duty and about your own self-righteousness rather than focusing on the righteousness of Christ. We see this play out all the time. And, and you can be any shade of legalist out there, from, from the suit and tie wearing conservative to, to the skinny jeans wearing hipster, uh, hybrid driving, more progressive thinking in your way. Basically, it becomes a matter of fulfilling those duties in such a way that you think that what you do is what saves you or what you do makes you superior to someone else. writer named uh, Michael Horton writes this. He says, what would it look look like if Satan really took control of a city? Over half a century ago, Minister Donald Gray Barnhouse offered his own scenario in his weekly sermon that was broadcast on CBS radio. He speculated that if Satan took over Philadelphia, all the bars would be closed, all the porn would be banished, pristine streets would be filled with tiny pedestrians who smiled at each other, and there'd be no swearing. Your kids would say, yes, sir, and no, ma'am, and churches would be full every Sunday where Christ is not preached. In other words, one of Satan's biggest goal is to make us really, really good without God. What if the worst thing that could happen to you is that you could be really, really moral, really, really upright, and do it all without God's help without the grace of Christ backing you up. What if your morality was not rooted in your performance, but rather in the righteousness given to you by Christ? Legalism pulls us away from the grace by saying that your performance is good enough 
to, to earn superiority over someone else. The flip side is, is hedonism. Hedonism means pleasure-seeking or looking for your own pleasure. Same chapter, Philippians 3, verses 18 and 19. Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. So, so the second thing that, that robs us of the truth of the gospel is hedonism. If, if religion was about fulfilling duty, hedonism is about fulfilling personal needs. And rather than focusing on self-righteousness, hedonism focuses instead on self-discovery, about being authentic, about being real, but, but without ever really looking towards Christ. And if you look at what they hold in common, is that both are very self-focused and both struggle with feelings either of inferiority or superiority. If I'm doing better in my performance than someone else, I can look down on you for not doing as well as I am. If, if I am not doing as well as someone else, though, I may feel guilty and broken for failing to meet those standards. And whatever those standards are, whether it's the, the progressive Christian hybrid driving hipster Christianity, or whether it's the more conservative end of things with the way you raise your kids or the, the way you send your kids to school or the Christian radio you might listen to or the Christian books. And I'm not against any of those things. But when those things take the place of Christ's grace and Christ's righteousness, what we're left with is a, is a system and a society that is fundamentally broken and barriers are formed. You've seen this diagram before of the bounded set. I've introduced this to you. Basically, it means that we define who's in and who's out. And usually it's based on performance. In Ephesians chapter 2, he says this, Remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision. He talks about how they were once alienated from the promises, and, and now because people are looking towards religious duty and religious service, we have now created barriers in our culture that says, these people are in and these folks are out. See, when we, we don't fully understand the gospel, we're, we're left with these crazy ideas that we can define who belongs and who does not belong based on appearance or based on performance. So there are two important don'ts, going back to our notes. Don't play God and don't major in the minors. Don't play God and don't major in the minors. A number of years ago, I had to get CPR certified for, for a job I, I had at the time. This was back in high school, so we'll say five or six years ago. And uh, when, you, when you take CPR classes, you have to actually work on a, a dummy, and you have to actually practice giving mouth-to-mouth -to, -mouth to basically a mannequin. And, and, and to sanitize everything for you, they give you a little, a little mouth guard, you slide that in and, and you just throw away your mouth guards. You don't have to actually put your lips on the same dummy that someone else put their lips on. It's very sanitary and very clean and very good. But what the instructor said to us is that if you ever have to do this in real life, it won't be that clean. Like you won't have a mouth guard with you. I mean, you, I mean, you could carry one with you if you're weird. But you, you won't have the same clean experience you had here in this class. Real people are going to be messier. And the truth is, outside of our walls, real people will be messier. We can't play God, and we can't major in minor things. They may or may not agree with you on your political views. They may or may not agree with you on your stance on the Second Amendment. They may or may not agree with you on your stance for abortion or gay marriage or any of those other things. Now, now these, those might not seem like minor issues, and I'm not necessarily saying that they are, but I'm saying that comparatively, are we more interested in having people look like us or more interested in having people look like Jesus? If we are concerned about the gospel, then our hope and our, our efforts are directed towards seeing those people come to the hope that is found in Jesus and not merely win them over to our idolatrous religious devotion. So here's what Paul is actually saying. He's got, on the one side of things, he's got the legalists. On the other side, he's got the hedonists. 
And if you look at your chapter 3, right there, like wedged in the middle, he gives his own testimony. See, here's the thing about Paul, you have to understand. Paul was more religious than you could ever be. Like he was trained in like the finest Hebrew schools. He was homeschooled through grad school. Um, he had nothing but Christian radio stations on his car. He had the fish on the bumper. Like he had everything. Like no matter how religious you think you are, Paul was more so. At the same time, when he, when he, before he came to know Christ, he persecuted the early church. He actually had them dragged away and executed. So, so Paul was equally more sinful than you and I could ever imagine. He, he had both of those lifestyles in his pedigree, and so now he understood more than anyone else that, that living the gospel-centered life is not about finding a balance between two extremes, but finding a new path entirely. See, Paul is not concerned with how religious you are or how broken you are because he recognizes that apart from Christ, it doesn't matter which end of the spectrum you are, you're still lost. It doesn't matter if you came out of your mama clutching a bottle of communion wine or grape juice or a bottle of Jack. Like, like what you need is Jesus, no matter what. So in, in chapter three, he says this. He says that, okay, regarding his background, I consider it at loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but, what, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. I'd love to camp out here for the next, like, half hour. Like, it would be great. Like, there's just so many spectacular gospel-centered truths just in these few verses alone. We, we don't have time, and you guys would stone me. Like, it would be bloody and horrible, and I don't think there's life insurance involved with that either. I don't know. Um, but, but here's the thing. We, could, we can pull out some very basic gospel truths, and some of these you might even remember from our previous series, looking at the different word to describe the atoning work of Christ on the cross. And so I've, I've listed here um, seven attributes of the gospel-centered life. We'll start with a new intimacy. Who, who remembers the word that we used just very recently to describe the new relationship that we have because Christ has destroyed the barrier between us and, and God? Start with an R. Reconciliation. Because I'm reconciled to God, now I have a new intimacy with God. He's no longer my judge. He's now my dad. I now have a new intimacy with God, a new relationship with God. Secondly, I have a new confidence. What was the word we used when we said that, that Christ's righteousness was actually given to me, that I'm now considered righteousness, righteous because of what Christ has done? Start with an I. Imputation. Because now I possess all the righteousness of Christ, I have God's complete and total approval. I can be confident now. There are two situations I want to try to address with this. You ever, you ever had that experience where um, you want to share your faith but what you might say to yourself, I don't want to be the kind of person that shoves my religion down someone else's throat. What are we really saying? We're saying that I'm not comfortable making other people uncomfortable. But if I have God's approval, then it doesn't matter what other people think of me. It doesn't matter what other people might say and, and react to me. I can now be confident that because I have God's approval, I'm now free and liberated to make people angry with me if speaking truth in their lives is what does that. I, I'm now liberated. I'm now free to offend people if that's what they need. I can now be confident because of what Christ has done. A new humility. Because it's Christ's work and not mine. Now I can love people unconditionally. Like there might be people in our lives right now that we think, are so far from God that they are definitely on the outside and not the inside of that, that bounded set diagram. But if, if I am humble, I recognize that it's by God's grace alone, then there are no more hard cases. 
there's no longer those folks in my life that I look at and say, this person is just a lost cause and they'll never come to know Jesus. I can be humble enough to recognize my own brokenness and my own wickedness and my own deceitfulness and that while I was still a sinner, Christ died for me. And because of that humility, I can be confident that Christ will draw all men to himself. A new motivation. If, if God is no longer my judge but my father, that I'm no longer motivated to, to just try to get out of jail or, or get out of hell for free, now, now duty is replaced with a sense of delight. Like I want to spend time investing in what God asks us to invest in. I want to spend time in his word. I want to spend time praying to God. My religious service, whether here at this church or, or even in our families, become acts of worship, not acts of obligation. A new future. Even Paul talked about the, the attaining the resurrection that we're having in our future, that we no longer have to fear the suffering of this world because the very greatest enemy of all, death, has been defeated. If you are very religious in your understanding or in your orientation, then you can't always process suffering because suffering becomes a punishment for you that maybe you didn't succeed or maybe you weren't good enough, and that's why God is not allowing things to work out in your life the way you expected. But the gospel says that Christ defeated Satan and the powers of death, and now we will experience one day the resurrection. And finally, two more things. The new purpose, that we seek after God, and we share that love with others, and, and we do that through a new community that we are no longer fragmented and broken. We are no longer individuals, but we are connected together in, in one household. Going back to our diagram, we find this. We have a contrast now between the bounded set of who's in and who's out and the centered set of what direction people are moving in. See, what the gospel says it's not a lot about how far you seem from God. It's about what direction you're moving in. If you can face and turn towards the Savior... Which means that, yes, there are some people who are, who are moving further or further away, fr closer to or further from Christ. But it means that we're no longer looking towards their behavior, we're looking towards their devotion. Ephesians chapter 2, verse, verse 13 says the same group of people who were just these circumcised versus the uncircumcised. He says this now, Now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near to the blood of Christ. What that means is this. If we understand the gospel to be solely based on God's grace and not performance, it means that we no longer draw a strict boundary between who is in and who is out, but instead are called to, in our own lives, elevate Christ, glorify God in such a way that those people turn their attention to Christ because of the example that we have shown in our own lives. Our, our final blank is this. It says, God's solution... God's solution is threefold. First is that love's source is found in the Holy Spirit. Romans 5.5 5 says this, Hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. See, here's the thing about Christianity that's very different. See, I can make myself a Hindu, or I, I can make myself a Muslim. I, I can make myself very religious. I can make myself follow all the rules, all the commands, and I can actually convert that way. Christianity is very different. You can't make yourself a Christian. It's something that happens to you. Something that has been done for you. It's something you, you accept and take hold of, yes, but you can't make yourself any more or less a Christian because Christ's blood has always been, already been sufficient for you and the Spirit now comes in and the Spirit is what actually does the work and actually accomplishes God's sovereign purpose. Secondly, love covers. First Peter says this, Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. In other words, rather than looking towards people's behavior and figuring out, okay, this person is far from God or near from God, recognizing that because of what Christ has done on the cross, that blood covers over all of these things and that we are now renewed creations because of what the cross has accomplished. Thirdly, love binds. Colossians says this, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. See, it's really easy to follow all the rules. 
it's really easy to be a really deeply religious person. If you follow all the commandments, if you do everything the Bible tells you to do, you'll, you'll probably be a pillar in your community and well-respected within your church, but you won't necessarily be a godly person. You won't necessarily be a godly, holy person. You won't be living the gospel-saturated life. You'll be living a life of, of good guy, self-righteous moralism. And what Christ has done, he's actually come and stepped into our world in such a way that, that he's actually calling each of us to repent of our moralism. He's calling us to repent of our hedonism. He's calling us to repent of our focus on ourselves and to turn that focus onto his son exclusively. How many of you watch um, Duck Dynasty? It's one of the most popular shows in America right now. Um, some of you actually might know that many of the characters, I'm not even sure of all of them, but many of the characters are actually professing Christians. And so I wanted you to watch a video just very quickly um, where we actually meet one of the characters from the show. I shouldn't say character, it's, it's, a, it's a reality show. But one of the men from the show and uh, his own experience of the gospel-centered life. sister is the one that brought him and while he was in the back trying to get a Bible study going with the old guy here yours truly, my sister was up on the front and she's handing out Bible tracts so that created a little bit of a ruckus in the beer joint so I had to go out there and tell everybody, look the girl wants to hand out Bible tracts take them, throw them in the trash can, do whatever you want, but don't be messing with my sister here I'll break your legs. So I ran the guy off, but later on I looked him back up when my life was pretty well going south in a hurry. So at 28, I finally sit down and listen for the first time in my life to the story about Jesus of Galilee, the one we're all counting time by. It is currently 2000 and 13 years since Jesus got here. 2013 A.D. Anno Domini. So we're all counting time by Jesus. I just decided to follow him 38 years ago when I heard that he in fact was God in flesh. Not only was he God in flesh, uh, it took the blood of God to remove my sex, drugs, and rock and roll lifestyle. Sin. That's the price. Well, I'm sitting there listening to that. I thought, man, that was a mighty kind thing to do for a scumbag like me. Not only that, it really would do no good to have my sins removed, which are many. It wouldn't do me any good, though, if something could not be done about the six-foot hole I'm going into. And you too, by the way. So we're all sinners. Jesus dies on a cross to remove all of them so you can go, I'm guilty no longer. Isn't that awesome? Each of us has a story very similar to that. The gospel-centered life means that, like, like the duck commander, we focus more on the grace of God than the performance of man. That, that rather than, than focusing so resolutely on self, that we focus on Christ. And when we do that, when our lives reflect that, others will see that and be drawn to it. Even the angels long to look at the gospel, it says. Even the angels never get bored with the gospel. 
that we long to hear the gospel over and over again. We long to experience the gospel in our lives, in our hearts. Do we? The band's going to come at this time. We're having a time of communion, gathering around these tables. We gather at these tables to celebrate this, this death, this gospel that's been poured out for us in the body and blood of Christ. We do this so regularly and so frequently, not because it's another religious ritual, but because we recognize that to have a, a life that is saturated and just centered around the gospel of Jesus, it, it, it means that, that every aspect of our lives, everything we think, do, or say, becomes motivated not by works, but by grace. So if you just bow your heads with me, just pray before we go to our tables. Father, we are so thankful for your gospel that tells us that we are liberated from the tyranny of self and the prison of sin. And Lord, we are thankful that instead you have given us a new life and a new hope that's found only in your son, Jesus. Lord, we pray that we would not be people who um, experience the condemnation of legalism, but instead the joy of following after your son that we would see his shining face in all that we do, and others would be drawn closer to him through our example. In your son's name we pray these things by your spirit's power. Amen.